Good afternoon. My name is Katrina Kilmartin, and I'm going to be speaking about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders today. One of the ways that I've gotten into learning about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders is through the Proof Alliance of North Carolina and they support families and individuals impacted by fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, which I'm going to refer to as FASD moving forward. Next slide talks about uh, the prevention of alcohol exposed pregnancies and the role that we can all play in prevention. We do acknowledge that our verbiage includes uh, mostly mothers, female, woman, and feminine related pronouns, but we do understand that uh, this could be any person who is expecting and pregnant with a child. Here are some of our objectives. Three of our major topics, we'll start out by talking about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, FASDs, including its cause, some of the characteristics associated with it, and how common it is. And then we will increase our awareness about alcohol, standard serving sizes, and binge drinking, talking about alcohol use and how each of us can make safer alcohol choices. After that, we'll discuss the importance of planned pregnancies and our call to action. So what is a FASD? FASD stands for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, which are brain-based disabilities with a wide range of effects that can be physical, mental, behavioral, and or learning disabilities. FASD is a medical disorder that is caused by prenatal alcohol exposure or drinking alcohol during a pregnancy. Prenatal alcohol exposure can cause brain injury and the effects of this typically last for a person's entire lifetime. And there isn't a, currently a cure for FASD, but early intervention and supports can help provide people with FASD live happier, more fulfilling, and successful lives. We can support people with FASD, and we can also prevent future cases of FASD by supporting people to have alcohol-free pregnancies. Despite all of the research that says alcohol is dangerous during pregnancy, it's very common in our community still. Overall, it's estimated that up to 1 in 20 children in the United States have an FASD. This makes FASD more prevalent than spina bifida, Down syndrome, and autism. It's important to remember that it's a spectrum disorder. That means that each case is unique and not everyone with a FASD has the same characteristics. Some of the characteristics will appear during different developmental stages, which means some of the characteristics might appear during infancy, while others don't appear until adolescence. And it's also important to note that intelligence level is not a good indicator whether or not someone has a FASD. People with a FASD can have very high IQ but that doesn't mean that they haven't been impacted in other ways by prenatal alcohol exposure. These are some of the characteristics that you'll find that someone with FASD could have. Low birth weight, slow to develop, irritability or anger, sensitivity and light, noise, touch, trouble sleeping, hyperactivity, and others. And these characteristics can show up at different stages of life. For example, you might notice irritability in an infant, but they may not show hyperactivity until they're a toddler or later in school. Some other characteristics that are common among people with FASD are speech and language delays, poor social skills, short attention span, poor coordination, impulse control, and poor memory. These can lead to things like low self-esteem, difficulty in school, and potentially involvement with the criminal justice system. When working with individuals who have a FASD, it's important to find what is working and focus on those strengths to help an individual succeed. We understand that the earlier the FASD can be identified, the sooner supports can be put into place. If someone thinks they might have a FASD, well, how do they get diagnosed? 
Well, unfortunately, there is not a simple medical test like a blood test or an x-ray to confirm a diagnosis under the FASD umbrella. Instead, FASD is diagnosed by a team of professionals assessing four specific areas. One, prenatal alcohol history. Two, brain func function and structure. Three, facial features and four, growth issues. Here in North Carolina, there are two sites that do FASD assessments, which are Fullerton Genetics in Asheville and Atrium Health in Charlotte. And families need a referral from the child's primary care provider. For more information on the diagnostic process, you can check out the Proof Alliance North Carolina webpage in addition to the effects described by people in uh, previous slides, prenatal alcohol exposure can also cause birth defects. In fact, in the United States, drinking during pregnancy is the leading cause of birth defects. Alcohol causes more birth defects than smoking and illegal drugs, which can be kind of surprising to hear. We might assume that alcohol would be safer during pregnancies than drugs like methamphetamines or heroin because alcohol is legal, but that's not necessarily the case. We know that during drinking during pregnancy can cause brain injury, which is what causes behavioral effects that we've been talking about. But it can also cause birth defects like microcephaly, which causes the baby's head and brain to be much smaller than expected. Heart defects, hearing or vision problems, abnormalities in the bones, kidneys, and other organs. And abnormal facial features in development of the lip, mid face, and eyes. Again, not everyone with prenatal alcohol exposure or FASD will have these birth defects, but if there is prenatal alcohol exposure during pregnancy, the child has an increased risk of being born with one or more of these congenital disorders. You might be wondering, if prenatal alcohol exposure can cause birth defects, can you tell if someone has been impacted by just looking at them? Well, there are some facial features that have been linked to prenatal alcohol exposure, like a thin upper lip, a smooth space between the nose and lips, smaller eyes, However, most people on the spectrum do not have any of these facial features. Actually, only about 10 to 15% do, and they're generally found on people who have been diagnosed specifically with fetal alcohol syndrome. Even when there are facial features, it doesn't give you any idea how the brain was impacted by prenatal alcohol exposure. And that invisible brain injury is by far the most serious effect of prenatal alcohol exposure. With that all in mind, which trimester is the safest to drink? Do you think it's the first, the second, or the third trimester? Well, there's a myth that's, that it's safe to drink alcohol during the third trimester because the baby's more developed, but this isn't true. There is no safe time to drink alcohol during pregnancy, and prenatal alcohol exposure during any trimester can cause brain injury, injury and other birth defects. If you're curious how alcohol impacts different parts of the body and can cause some people to have facial features and others not to have any, this chart can be helpful. It shows how alcohol can affect fetal, out, fetal development from three weeks through 38. From the beginning, of the first trimester to the end of the third, different parts of the body are developing at different stages of pregnancy. And if there's alcohol exposure while a certain organ is developing, it's likely to be impacted. As you can see, the central nervous system, which includes the brain and spinal cord, is developing throughout the entire pregnancy. And this means that drinking alcohol at any stage in the pregnancy can impact brain development. Other organs can be affected by alcohol exposure throughout the pregnancy too. For example, 
the heart is most vulnerable during the first eight weeks. And some people don't even know they're pregnant during this time. One key message we hope that you will take away from this presentation is that there's no safe amount of alcohol during pregnancy. The risk to the fetus gets larger with the more alcohol use. But even drinking at low levels can affect fetal alcohol development. Well, what's considered low level depends on each study you look at. A study that was published in 2019 found that children who were exposed to one to four drinks per week were 8.5 times more likely to have effects on fetal development. So as few as four standard servings a week can have lifelong effects on a child. Because of this, the scientific community continues to advise that the healthiest and safest choice is to completely abstain from alcohol during pregnancy. Another reason that we advocate for not drinking any alcohol during pregnancy is that every pregnancy is different. There are a variety of factors that affect how alcohol exposure will impact the developing embryo or fetus. Some factors make the fetus more resilient to alcohol exposure, which means they may not have as many effects, or and other factors that make the fetus more vulnerable, which means they're more likely to have effects from being exposed to alcohol. We're gonna go through a list of different factors and keep in mind that each of these things play a role in how alcohol is going to affect the fetus. So let's start off with genetics. Genetics are the genes that each parent pass on to their children. The genes affect how much the child will be impacted by prenatal alcohol exposure. For example, studies have found that identical twins who share identical DNA typically have the same effects if they've had the same prenatal alcohol exposure. However, fraternal twins, which do not have the same DNA, can have very different effects after being exposed, even though they were both in the womb at the same time and had the same level of exposure. Researchers aren't exactly sure yet how genes play a role, but these examples show that they do appear to affect how vulnerable a fetus is to alcohol exposure. It's all alcohol, no matter how it's served. Whether it's beer, kombucha, wine, hard lemonade, ciders, shots, liquors, jello shots, boozy ice creams, snow bars, powder alcohol, alka pops. Have you heard of these kinds of things before? They're actually quite popular. Kombucha is a sweetened grain tea or black fermented tea with uh, a certain bacteria and yeast otherwise known as scobies and they work together in a balance but once it's added to a sweetened tea and left to ferment for a period of weeks the result is a tangy bubbly beverage that's slightly alcoholic. More information on that is mothertobaby.org and you can look up information about kombucha. Perhaps you're curious about powdered alcohol. Well, it's added to mixers and can be up to 50 to 70% alcohol by volume, though it's not legal here in North Carolina. Maybe you're thinking, what is Whipahol? Well, it's exactly how it sounds. Whipped cream infused with alcohol, usually at about a 15% alcohol by volume. A lot of these can be confusing or misleading, but alcohol is alcohol. Sometimes craft beer even is served in smaller glasses, less than 12 ounces, but the alcohol percentage and proof is much higher than a traditional standard domestic beer. Sometimes it'll say good for the heart. And so pregnant people may, may think that wine is safe to drink, but this is because of misinformation. For those of us who choose to drink alcohol, it's important to be aware of what kind of drinking is lower risk and what alcohol use might be, to be something to be concerned about. One of the most important things to know when drinking alcohol is what a standard serving of alcohol is. Many people are actually surprised to learn what actually counts as one drink. In general, it's 12 ounces of beer, 5 ounces of wine, 
or 1.5 ounces of distilled spirits like vodka, whiskey, and tequila. However, different types of beer, wine, and liquor can have varying amounts of alcohol content, and this is why it's important to know how much alcohol your specific drink contains. And this can be especially an issue at parties when someone else is serving the drinks or you don't get to pour your own. If you haven't seen the drink get made, how much can you be sure that you know what's in the cup that you're drinking by amount? When does drinking become binge drinking? Well, because of the different ways men and women metabolize alcohol differently, binge drinking is defined as four or more drinks in two hours for women and five or more drinks in two hours for men. And this means that if you're drinking a mixed drink that has two or three shots of liquor in it, it could be considered binge drinking if you drink two cups of that during a party. It can be easy for what seems like just a couple of drinks to easily become four or five standard servings, even if it doesn't seem like you're having that much. It's important to note that most people who binge drink do not have an alcohol use disorder which means they aren't addicted to alcohol. However, there is support available if you're worried about your amount of drinking. In the United States, 17% of adults binge drink, and it's most common among adults who are 18 to 34 years of age. That's also the most common age range that people become pregnant. With this in mind, is it true or false that only people with alcohol use disorders have children with FASD? This is false. There seems to be a myth that FASD only happens to children whose parents have alcohol use disorders. And while alcohol use disorders can increase the risk of an alcohol exposed pregnancy, there are many other factors that can lead to an alcohol exposed pregnancy and FASD. It's important to note that FASD exists in all communities, including different races, ethnicities, incomes, and people with or without alcohol use disorders. 14% of all pregnancies in the United States are exposed to alcohol. That means one in seven pregnancies are exposed to alcohol. Like we discussed, there are many different reasons that people are drinking during pregnancy. Well, what does that number look like in North Carolina? Here, 93% quit drinking alcohol after they found out they were pregnant. This means that 7% continue to drink during pregnancy. North Carolina's rate of alcohol exposed pregnancies is much lower than the national average of 13.5%. However, even at 7%, this means that over 8,500 babies are born exposed to alcohol in North Carolina. We're working to inform, support, and empower people so that eventually we'll, we'll be able to say, 100% of people have alcohol-free pregnancies. With all of this information available, you might be wondering, well, why do people drink during pregnancy? And there's a lot of different reasons. Consider, maybe drinking before the pregnancy was always there and it wasn't, the pregnancy hadn't been known or confirmed. Maybe someone's not aware of the risks associated with prenatal alcohol exposure. Maybe someone has heard inaccurate information by a healthcare provider or a news article somewhere. It's possible that knowing someone who drank during pregnancy, whose child has not been diagnosed with FASD, can be misleading. Having an alcohol use disorder and not receiving the proper support to have an alcohol-free pregnancy. The fact that drinking alcohol is a legal and socially acceptable norm. And there's always um, the opportunity for peer pressure to drink from family and friends. Here are some of the documented points that I just discussed on the previous slide. Did y'all think of any of these? In North Carolina, 46% of pregnancies are unplanned. And this shows just how important it is to choose an effective form of birth control that works for you and your partner and that you feel confident in using it properly. In addition, more than half of women didn't find out they were pregnant until at least five weeks into pregnancy. 
14% didn't find out until at least week nine. And because they didn't find out they were pregnant for at least a month, they may have been drinking alcohol during that time. Whether you want to become pregnant in the near future or not, it is important to talk with your healthcare provider about family planning options. One of the most critical times to prevent any issues in your pregnancy is before you even become pregnant. If you do want to become pregnant, there are steps you can take to prepare for a healthy pregnancy, such as talking with your healthcare provider and that you want to, to about wanting to become pregnant within the next year not using alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs, and trying to follow a healthy lifestyle by eating nutritious foods, exercising appropriately, and getting seven to eight hours of sleep each night. You can also talk with your healthcare provider if you would like more information about the resources in your community that provide support for alcohol-free pregnancies, such as support groups or recovery services. And if you don't want to become pregnant, but you are sexually active, there are a variety of safe and effective methods that you and your partner can use to prevent pregnancy. Your healthcare provider can talk to you about different options so you can decide what might work best. We all play a role in preventing FASTI and supporting those impacted. And thank you so much for your time and attention today. If you have any more questions, please let me know. All of us can make safer choices that prevent fast D, and you have the information that you need to help prevent a child from having a lifelong disability. Even if pregnancy seems like light years away or not on your radar at all right now, please remember that lifestyle choices you're making today can play a role in family planning later in life. Even if you can't or don't want to become pregnant, you can still make safer choices related to alcohol and sex that will benefit your overall health and quality of life. And if you are pregnant now or be, might become pregnant in the future, please remember that there is no known safe amount of alcohol, no safe type of alcohol, and no safe time to drink alcohol during pregnancy. So with that in mind, one thing to remember from our discussions today is so that we all play a role in preventing FASD and supporting those impacted. Thank you so much for your time today. If you have any questions, please let me know. It would be really great if you took the time to scan this QR code on your screen to provide a little bit of feedback about today's information. And I hope that you have a wonderful day. Following this slide will be citations of our sources and resources from where we gathered information in case you were looking for a deeper dive into something we discussed earlier today.